Uh, gracias, Marcela. Thank you, Marcela. In the spirit of home and waking up, I'm going to be giving my talk in English too as well. Uh, so, the, I don't know if you can get the slides. Francisca. Uh, I started there. La primera. Ah. Okay, um, uh, I, I'm going to talk a, a few minutes uh, today about um, our experience over the last 10 years on, on working in tropical dry forests and, and the collective uh, work uh, done by, by many, many people in, in Mexico, Costa Rica, Venezuela, Cuba, um, also in Brazil, and, and Bolivia and so forth that have over the years contributed to uh, in different aspects of, 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 a, of a work on understanding tropical dry forests across the Americas. Um, tropical dry forests are uh, deciduous ecosystems. Um, they have um, an average temperature of 25 degrees and also they have um, uh, something very interesting that has a very strong uh, signal that can be detected from the space. And uh, over the years, uh, NASA satellites and also NOAA satellites have been uh, collecting that signal and uh, allowing us to look at the uh, temporal trends. What you can see here is uh, the, what we call the winners and, and losers in the Americas about uh, the tropical dry forests. And uh, as uh, you can see from the top, uh, we have uh, three different types of responses. Uh, negative productivity trends in, the, in, the, in Brazil, in the Caatinga is an area that home was mentioned uh, uh, several times in her talk, and uh, which uh, it really is presenting uh, negative trends in productivity. Uh, forests close to the equator uh, are showing uh, a very stable productivity trends in terms of uh, uh, NDVI signals. And uh, a dry charcoal uh, and also some forests in Colombia, Venezuela, Costa Rica, and Yucatan are showing uh, a positive productivity trends, basically uh, a decrease in the dry season, meaning that it's getting wetter and the forests are growing longer. And then uh, closer to Mexico, we have a, a mixed bag so, of results. So basically, what's showing us is that they, uh, a, we cannot uh, expect that the tropical dry forests will have the same trends that uh, of those other ecosystems outside of the of the Amazon, and they have to be considered by their own uh, specific, uh, our own different uh, uh, biodiversity process. So, uh, what do we know about uh, 10 years ago with this study? And then uh, we look at all the papers uh, looking at tropical dry forest ecosystems, and uh, we found out that for every 300 papers published in the, in the tropics and in, in, in with the word forest, uh, 300 were from rainforest and, and one for dry forest, and uh, highly biased, and uh, we can see that they, uh, today things are still the same, and still very unknown ecosystem, and uh, in where, which about 85% of, of all the papers uh, produce uh, are old growth, uh, and very little in terms of secondary forest or watershed analysis. Being the most dominant country in terms of productivity of uh, of forests, uh, Mexico, followed by Costa Rica and Brazil, and be very little from other countries like Colombia, Peru, and Bolivia, which have, have large extents of dry forests, but they are under study. Uh, this is what we are confronting. These are an example of a, um, a succession, what we call the fingerprint of succession for tropical dry forests and what the tropic dry in general is looking at. And, uh, the, we are looking at the uh, early stages that well, this is right after abandonment and uh, farmers leave their land for many reasons, in many cases socioeconomic, and uh, the forests are coming back. So we are very interested in looking at how these forests look like and what, what are their ecosystem services across the succession stage going all the way from early stages into late stages. And we, we actually show in this picture the difference that you can see between wet and dry season extremely marked and very interesting for uh, uh, biodiversity and remote sensing status. Uh, 
Uh, we have basically uh, in our project uh, look at uh, uh, four main uh, uh, four, uh, uh, succession uh, fingerprints, uh, biological, spectral, uh, structural, and hydrological and microclimate. So I'm going to brief uh, talk a, a little bit more about each one of those fingerprints. Uh, from, the, from the ecological point of view, uh, we're looking at uh, species richness and composition, how they change over time, biomass change over time. Uh, Herb Gori worked by, uh, especially led by Mario Marcos Espiritu Santo from Brazil, a great team working there, the phenology group too as well. And uh, uh, from the structural work, uh, uh, we're looking at uh, key elements like woody area index, leaf area index, various variables that can be detected from space from many different NASA missions. Uh, and also looking very closely at the fraction of photosynthetic active radiation, which is the amount of light that the forests are using for photosynthesis in the area between 400 and 700 nanometers. And then from the spectral point of view, uh, we also think that it's just not, not only mapping uh, a, a complex variables in the landscape, but uh, we need to ex export them using remote sensing technologies. So we are looking at the concentration of chlorophyll, carotenoids, water content, etc., and how this can actually help us to, to develop index that can be linked to a forest health over time. Okay, this is the interaction between different elements that we are looking into tropic dry, and uh, basically it, it goes back to the bottom line that uh, everything is interconnected. We cannot look at different variables alone and try to spec that we can understand tropical dry forests. Each one of them are strongly linked among themselves and are, are, are along different fingerprints. And uh, this allows us to, to uh, get a very interesting uh, uh, picture of how they are evolving over time. Uh, this is an example that may be very interesting. This is how we see the different ones. This is a structural fingerprint. A spectral fingerprints with different, looking from a very high resolution satellite, from, and then this is ecological fingerprint, this is the structural fingerprint, and uh, you can see how there's a very strong relationship between what we can see from satellites and what we can see from the ground. So what we are trying to do is, at least the ecology group is also looking to the different variables. So if we look very briefly at the ecological fingerprints, uh, we, we see stuff that we, we have notice in many different places around the world. Uh, for example, rich, species richness increase uh, with succession uh, with the section of, of Brazil and Costa Rica, which are very interesting. And these higher species richness are in fact uh, uh, a, the result of liana presence. Uh, lianas are structural parasites that grow in trees and tend to kill them. And uh, what is happening is they have higher diversity in the uh, in the intermediate stages and the late stages. And uh, their proliferation is a very important signal of climate change in, in the forest. So therefore, this is a very interesting mechanism for, for looking at uh, how they respond, this ecosystem eventually will respond to climate change. Uh, we have uh, other elements like this, like uh, for example, the, the relationship with the species diversity, the species density, and increase with succession, which is suspected. And uh, the same thing can be seen from basal area and, uh, and biomass content. So, but it, when we look at the total biomass, definitely less biomass than you can expect from a, from a tropical rainforest, but uh, that doesn't mean that they're not important. They play very important ecosystem services beyond just producing biomass. Uh, from the spectral point of view, this is drone work uh, uh, that we have been doing a lot uh, in, in Costa Rica and also trying to look into Brazil. And basically what we're looking at this is how forests reflect light. Uh, uh, this is uh, an early stage, and this is an intermediate stage, and this is a, a late stage. And you can see this peak right here. This is the peak of a chlorophyll absorption. And uh, that's, uh, that's how the forests look green. So we actually play with this kind of spectral variables. Now we're being a little bit more unconventional. A lot of remote sensing is done in this area. We say we know a lot about this. Let's take a look at this area in the short wave infrared where the light is not controlled by pigments, but the reflected light is controlled by water content. 
So we have been doing a lot of work in trying to understand how the different forests can be actually mapped with the shortwave infrared. And uh, uh, one of the main problems, again, is the presence of lianas that you guys can see right here, uh, and how can we separate them uh, across time. This is an example for Santa Rosa, some of the work that was done, it was published last year, using hyperspectral remote sensing, and actually looks at how the distribution of forests early, intermediate, and late is present. Uh, and you can see the high level of a, <coughs> uh, a, a complexity that the tropical dry forests have. When you look at the traditional maps uh, that we have, uh, at least for Costa Rica, these forests are basically forests, non forests. You have uh, either green or, or, or white. Uh, and uh, we can actually, with this technology, we can actually look not only at the presence of uh, uh, different successions, but also what we are exploring too is a transition between those, those forests. And uh, using some ecological theory and lighter technology to see those when, when a forest goes from intermediate state to a later stage and what is the distance and how this, what kind of species do we have, how the structure of forests. So we can start seeing the complexity that this uh, tropical dry forest landscape have uh, beyond the forest non forest uh, categories. Uh, this is a, an example of the structural variables. This is a very advanced technology. It's a ground level technology, ground lighter, uh, that we, are, we have been using for uh, in, in Costa Rica as well, and we export, starting to work into Brazil. Uh, this is a, a cloud of points of about uh, a, an instrument that collects about uh, 500,000 points per second, and uh, this is uh, millions of millions of millions of uh, laser returns. And uh, we can actually start looking very closely at how these forest structures are uh, and separate them from the from the different levels of uh, ecosystem. Uh, complexity. Uh, what you can see here is it allows not only to map the top of the canopy, but also the understory of the canopy, so we can have very detailed digital elevation models, but also help us to separate trees. You can actually extract the trees, uh, the trunks, and the, and the leaves by themselves, and that which is a very interesting possibility to look at a, a forest from a different way and how they respond over time. Uh, one of the most interesting things as well is when we go and we fly this in a plane or a drone, we can see how the signal moves through the canopy and we can actually detect uh, not only the top of the canopy, but we can take the structure underneath. So this is an example of a forest. This is the, the top of the canopy, emerging trees, and this is a, a canopy trees, and this is all a, the understory trees. So we can use that technology to actually map the, using ecological theory the which type of forest, not, it's not only what kind of forest it is, it's primary or secondary or early intermediate stage, but what is the ecological mechanism that creates the forest? So we know that uh, wind dispersed forests have very flat canopies, meanwhile vertebrate dispersed forests have like a dome shape uh, canopies, so we can use ground level technology to actually detect where the, where the forest, the secondary forest that is created by wind dispersion is, and where the secondary forest is created by animal dispersal. So not only we can just bring a new dimension up about where the forest is, forest non forest, we can actually go early in the middle stage and now we can say we can say this comes from vertebrates or this comes from uh, wind dispersed. So it, it helps a lot in the complexity. This is also work that we have been doing at the Santa Rosa National Park in Costa Rica. At the end, too, as well, we can develop these nice curves that you guys can see here. This is the waveform amplitude of the lighter signal versus the relative elevation, and we can see how well they separate uh, across the different succession. And these the kind of tools can be used for more advanced uh, mapping and forestry components. This is another example, waveform amplitude and the radius of generation of the waveform. Again, we can see the early intermediate states extremely well separated. From the micrometeorological point of view, uh, with the efforts with the II, we have been doing a lot of work in, in Latin America too as well. Uh, this is very, is considered extremely innovative work, especially in this area right here, this yellow box. Uh, that's what we call wireless sensor networks. This is uh, the first grants for, for development. This kind of technology were promoted by the Inter-American Institute, and this is then taking off 
Uh, and basically what we're trying to do right now with this very advanced technology is to try to understand the impact of, uh, a, a, of drought in tropical dry forests because this actually has a very strong social component in the areas where we live. So we look at the at droughts, what happens when you have a year with a drought and if the drought is sustained over time. So we deploy these systems in the forest at very small boxes and then you can see it right there, the blue ones are basically representing uh, a, uh, the sensors, these are collectors of information and that information basically is sent across the forest, it's been sent to a satellite or cellular and automatically it's been sent to Barnet, which is a, an award-winning uh, cyber infrastructure that we developed and that then you guys can have your information in real time. Uh, it's a very advanced uh, technology that can help us to do a lot of different things uh, and uh, that was actually highly supported by the II. Very grateful of this. This is an example of the needle boxes being deployed in the field, hundreds of them sometimes. And uh, it, that helped us to build what we call a super site, an environmental monitoring super site that we have in Costa Rica. Uh, and uh, we have a similar one in Brazil. This, let me make the point, nothing like that exists outside of any tropical dry forest around the world. This is probably the most comprehensive better monitoring site that exists right now. It has four carbon flux systems, has a wireless sensor networks, has a hyperspectral observations, light technology. Uh, NASA uses as a calibration validation site. Um, so it's uh, the it's that they, it's been used by the uh, European Space Agency as well, the German Space Agency. So this is probably one of the most well understood sites you guys can imagine. It's like the Disneyland of tropical rainforest monitoring. So it's a, a fantastic place to look at. And uh, over time, this is from our super site in Brazil, we can see seeing changes in, in the growing season for the synthetic active radiation. It's very interesting to see the forest getting darker, uh, meaning that the leaf areas is increasing and, and, and other variables, uh, nuclear meteorological variables are changing. This is uh, the reflectance of the canopy over time, and this is the blue is during, a, this is Costa Rica, this is on the normal year, and this is during a linear year. So we can see dips and responses of a, of a forest that we're not able to do this. We're looking at data every 15 minutes. NASA produces data every 16 days. So it tells you the level of resolution that we have for, to understand this process, and this eventually can be translated into um, a water production, et cetera, and then goes into uh, different groups. In the, in the province of Guanacaste, they are looking at the productivity of this forest for uh, community services. This is also from Brazil. This is for a paper that is coming out uh, a, very soon uh, in, a, in a journal, Biotropica, and we would show the, the emerging technologies for, for monitoring tropical forests. And this is a, an example of a wire sensor network. And we have here a, a year of normal productivity. And uh, we have a storm happening, all the forests is altered. And we can see the differential response of the ecosystem with a normal uh, response and then with after the storm. Then we thought here that we were looking at an effect of uh, a, a, a sensor calibration, but eventually when we talk about Marcos, it was telling us that there was an insect attack, so there are specific areas that we can actually detect. If nothing, none of these can be observed right now by, by NASA sensors. So the, the ground-based information gives a very important role. Uh, just to close, see, uh, we have also some of the work done by Marcos and his group, very much engaged in, uh, in, in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil and uh, it's, it's how we, we try to protect this forest. And, and uh, it's not that we call political activists, but we call citizen scientists. And uh, we try to bring our science into the domain of, uh, of the, um, of, of the policy. So we, we, we look at this, uh, the Creto Federal de Centro de Matanseca, the Matacan de Estaquiano Justicia de Semprego. That's, that's basically the, 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 it's very interesting how our Brazilian colleagues went through each one of the arguments by, by the people attacking the, the, the existence of dry forests, and actually we block them. And, uh, and I think that this is basically gives a, based on solid science, 
no fake news, but real news. And, uh, and the, the fundamental element is that it helps to, to, to actually counteract uh, a, the, the response of uh, many different types of uh, interest groups uh, and uh, that actually make the point that the dry forests increase poverty, unemployment, uh, and famine, for example. And uh, if you go there and develop them, uh, you have uh, a rural development and, and work and, and, and everybody getting fat and happy. And uh, the, the fundamental element is that they, we need to strike a balance between sustainability of tropical dry forests and, and human progress. And uh, our Brazilian team uh, dealing with this kind of conflicts have shown that the soil science can play a very important role on actually um, a debunking uh, some of the uh, components. And uh, uh, for example, this one, let me see, I'm going too fast, but uh, I guess that I'm kicking out right now. But uh, they, they basically chose that w when we go all the way to the, um, a, in the process of law challenging, uh, we went all the way to, with Marie Marcos to the Brazilian Supreme Court and, uh, and that the fact that the Brazilian Supreme Court considered some of the laws uh, being implemented by the state of Minas Gerais as unconstitutional. It represents a very significant win of the tropical dry science uh, for the conservation of tropical dry forests. As Mario Marcos always says, this is not that we won the war, but just one battle. And the things are coming, but we, we are not, uh, we, we want to see our science being successful and, uh, and used by people. And, uh, and uh, I think that our Brazilian case, uh, sponsored by the AI, is probably one of the most successful things that we have done. We have done a lot of things, but the most thing that I'm more proud is how we were able to translate all the knowledge into, into policy and challenging that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.